is Sijing Shen. And she's going to talk about distributions of 06 around L star galaxy. Take it away. OK, great. Uh, I guess everybody can hear me well. Yeah? Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this fantastic conference. Uh, it's uh, very nice to be back to Santa Cruz. It feels like a hometown here. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, oxygen-6, so one ion, <laughs> maybe a little bit other ions, but oxygen-6 around uh, star-forming galaxies close to redshift zero. And this um, majority of the work, I mean, most of the work is done uh, by my master's student, Andrea Spilke. Uh, she did a master thesis project with me uh, in the past year, and then we're writing up now, so stay tuned. Uh, there'll be paper come out soon. So... Well, the reason, I guess I don't have to uh, say why we care about the circumgalactic medium, because this is telling us all, everything about feedback and viral cycles. So uh, the reason we talk about oxygen-6 is because there's lots of observation data. And especially with the come up of cos halos, uh, well, everybody, I guess most of the people here is quite familiar with this kind of plot. Uh, here is showing the, the column density of oxygen-6 around L-star galaxies at round redshift zero as a function of impact parameter, which is just the 2D distance. And you see the blue point is star-forming galaxies. You have a large column, oxygen-6. Uh, and if you kind of derive you know, what total amount of oxygen in this circumgalactic gas, you can find that there's actually more oxygen in the CGM compared to the disk. Okay, so lots of metals out there. Uh, the other interesting thing, which I'm not going to cover, is that the passive galaxy doesn't really have that much oxygen-6. So there's a bimodality, which is also well known. So uh, more than uh, the spatial distribution, uh, observers also get a very uh, nice data about the kinematics of this oxygen-6. Essentially, uh, you can look at the central velocity of these absorbers. Uh, the main uh, conclusion here for this L-star galaxy is they are not very, very large. They're, they're kind of close to zero, especially when you move to a higher mass, maybe there's indication. And then they're mostly within the escape velocity of the halo, right? So they're not that fast. And the other piece of information we have is that there is column density of oxygen 6 uh, versus the, the line width, so Doppler width of the, of the line. And we find that... Uh, if you have large column, you also have large broadening. And this broadening, uh, in terms of kilometer per second, is much larger than you would expect for 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 gas in, uh, in, in just thermal broadening. So this gas motion there can be detected. So now, it's quite recently, it's just based on this observation fact. We want to get the high column density. We want to get you know, the large broadening, uh, you know, the, the gas motion correct, and also based on some uh, other metal ions, so low metal ions chasing the cool gas. So from this information, observers or theorists are coming out with analytical models. What could be that causing the oxygen-6 large column? So there are kind of two pictures right now. Um, the first of all is the gas is cooling. This is a sort of cooling flow picture. The gas is cooling from a high temperature that's like corona gas or something. And through the transient T to 5.5 K window, and you have the oxygen-6 peak there. And in this picture, most of the O6 is collisionally ionized. And this is first come out with Heckman 2002, but there's a recent paper by McQueen and work uh, last year. Uh, so the... The heating mechanism of the gas, how this gas gets hot, uh, there are different pictures of it. Of course, it can be shock heating from structure formation, just a realized gas, or it can be feedback from galactic wind, or it can even be mixing layers between the hot and cold gas. Now, the condition for this, I'm, I'm not going to skip through all this derivation, is that the gas has to have quite high pressure. So the pressure range has to be in this value, and this is so-called a high pressure scenario. Now, the reason there's a paper come out this year is actually saying that the majority of oxygen-6 can also be explained by photon ionized by the UV background only. Now, in this, in this kind of picture, the gas has to be quite cool and also not that dense, right? So density is low, temperature is low, and this is a so-called low-pressure scenario. So it's one centimeter per cube K. So, so what I want to do here what we want to do 
is to answer this question, to look into a simulation and to answer you know, some of these questions. First of all, can simulation reproduce the oxygen-6 results? And what does that mean if we reproduce oxygen-6 results? And it seems from Dylan's talk yesterday, it could be quite a difficult task. Now, also, now if we have the oxygen-6, then in the simulation, at least, are they mostly photoionized or are they collisionized? Oh, we don't know. Well, and then if they are collisionized, means there needs some gas heating mechanism, what is the energy source? Is it from feedback, or is it from gas accretion, or is it some of both? Now, how does oxygen-6 evolve with time? This is also an interesting question, because when we talk about oxygen-6, it's always correlated with the star formation. When you have passive galaxy, you don't have that much oxygen-6. So if you think about you know, high redshift galaxies have higher star formation rate, maybe it look a little bit different. And then how the oxygen-6 correlates with low ionization uh, species. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but uh, it's also an interesting question. And you know, essentially, what can we learn about the CGM from the oxygen-6? Maybe we can learn a lot of things, maybe we can learn not much because it's such a transient state. Right, so the method we're using, uh, well, using the ARIS simulations. So since I'm in Santa Cruz, and ARIS is a Santa Cruz local produce, it was made by Javier Aguides a couple of years ago when, when she was a, a grad student. How can I get rid of this? All right. All right, good. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, while resolution is quite high, not the state of art today, but it's still quite high for, for Milky Way type of galaxies. We have this feedback, we have the star formation. I don't have time to talk about now and the UV background, and also uh, you know, primordial cooling. Now, one of the caveats of the original Eris ROM, which is very relevant to the study like Oxygen-6, is that it, is lack, it lacks the metal cooling at temperature larger than 10 to the 4K. So at 10 to the 4K or beyond, it's primordial cooling, which means the cooling rate is, can be a factor of few less with, as it should be. They affect the field according to the metallicity of the CGM gas. So, because of this, around the, uh, uh, no, a twin suit called ARIS 2K, well, the mean 2K means actually 2000. You can see how many parameters I've been played with. Is that when you put the, the metal line cooling, and it also have the more modern turbine diffusion, etc., and, well, then you could come up with an overcooling problem, of course. So, to compensate that, you have to increase the feedback. There's some not to tune to increase feedback so that the star formation at the end, I mean, at the end means ratio of 0 0.3 or so, uh, the stellar mass is pretty much the same. So these are the two Ks, okay, we're going to compare today. Uh, but even though, I mean, which case should I believe? I think adding metal line cooling is more realistic. But even though we're still lacking the local radiation field, which can produce, you know, cause heating or ionization, we're lacking the cosmic uh, ray heating or photoelectric heating. So there are mechanisms still missing. So, so, that, so the idea of this kind of study is to try to use these two simulations with little cooling, with more cooling, to break the result to see what is the effect of cooling and what is the effect of sort of ejective feedback in the circumductive medium. Okay, so to break the results. So analysis method, I don't have time to go through it. So we just produce some uh, cloudy tables of iron fractions, and, uh, and we get uh, an synthetic spectrum. So I talk about Eris first, because uh, to keep the story simple, and it comes up with Eris 2K a bit later. So this is how it looks like at the ratio of zero. And I don't know if you can see it, here is the view radius. So the green is 10 to the 14 per centimeter square, this is a huge column here, a large column all the way beyond the view radius. And that's how it looks like in the area simulation. Uh, the total amount of oxygen-6 is about a few times 10 to the 6 solar mass, which is quite consistent with the cost data when it derived the total amount of oxygen-6. And it's again that the amount of oxygen is larger in the halo uh, compared, to the, uh, compared to, the, to the galaxy itself. And the covering fraction of this is actually also quite high, you know, 90%, almost unity covering fraction, all the way to a large distance. So 
Next, I will show a movie just to see how this Oxygen 6 halo come to place. So this is the movie of Oxygen 6 at the one megaparsec, one megaparsec box, physical, uh, from redshift 3 all the way to redshift 0. OK? So let it go. Hi. There you go. So you can see, initially, you have a quite high column density of oxygen, and then it's kind of diffused, but still, you know, the, the green color is there. You've got to jump there. So it's, it's overall, you can see the picture of just the oxygen-6 gas kind of, you know, moving into the halo and outflowing. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> so you notice there is actually a jump <laughs> in some point in the movie. Let me look at it again. Right, large column, and then you have the dwarf structures, and you have the spreading of oxygen, and then there's some point there is a jump of oxygen six. Now, this jump is just because the, the move is not perfect, we're not using a continuous UV background, but it's also signified that the UV background or photoionization play an important role here. Um, so if we compare with the cost data, then what we see here is the ratio zero. Now the just works data and also some of the early in data, and this is how it looks like. Right? We don't have any trouble to reproduce oxygen-6, at least in this simulation. Uh, if we check what it looks like at redshift, uh, high redshift, so the, the, the orange and yellow line, I don't know if you can see, but uh, are the high redshift ones, and then it kind of decreases a little bit when it's removing through the low redshift. Now, you can see that you know, the, the evolution, if you, if you scale it by the view radius, the evolution of the radio profile, column density profile, doesn't seem to change that much through the whole period of time. A lot of giga years there, it doesn't seem to change much. Uh, of course, at high redshift, as I said, uh, all six fractions a bit higher, maybe a bit too high compared with the observations here. Now, if we look at column density, it's kind of confusing, so it's, it's helpful to look at what is the mass distribution of all six. And uh, this is, I just want to quickly frag through because this is from redshift 3 evolved to redshift 0. You can see it. It's actually peak at the view radius, almost at the view radius at each redshift. Now, this is time just a halo gas is grow with the, with, with the gaseous halo there. And this is uh, quite interesting. We see a jump here from the blue to the black, which is 0 0.5 to redshift 0. And this is also the ionization, which is, I will talk about. Uh, this is the total amount of oxygen, and then you see the oxygen is kind of peak, and then it grow, and then when they when they become bigger, it just kind of spread. So, question about photoionization versus collision ionization, right? So, the easiest thing way is to look at. You no, know, let's let's focus on the right panel first, and you see that this is this is oxygen six fraction of our total oxygen as a function of temperature and density, and you see a branch here. This is cloudy modeling which is not dependent on density. This is a collision ionization branch. And then, then, then the low density gas here is the photoionization branch. Okay. So if we look at a total oxygen 6 you know, mass distribution in, in this phase diagram, we see at the redshift 0, we see quite a bit of collision ionization still. There's collision ionization gas. But there is also a tail here with cooler gas of photoionization. If we bin it with uh, Distance, we see that in inside the galaxy within 100 kiloparsec, and this is within the view radius, uh, this is still mostly collision ionized. Maybe here you see a little bit of photoionization. And outside the view radius is mostly, well, not mostly, but a large portion of it is actually photoionized. And this is in the areas. Well, photoionization has such a, a strong impact, in fact, at, at towards the low redshift, is, is because if you look at ionization rate, it's actually dropped dramatically, it changes a lot at redshift 1 to redshift 0. So in between redshift 0 0.5 to redshift 0, there's a large drop, a factor of 5 drop in ionization rate. So if I took total gas distribution of the area simulation at redshift 0 and apply the UV background at redshift 0 0.5, you will see the halo become different. Right? And if you plot the, the column density again, then you see the black is the, 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 the different UV background, it drops quite a bit. So that's to signify the importance of photoionization in the simulation. Uh, so uh, when we come back to this analytical picture of high pressure 
versus low pressure scenario, and we can see whether the simulation is also telling the same story, uh, is I can plot you know, the pressure as a function of distance. And again, this dotted line are the view radius of, um, of, uh, of the, the simulation. So this is the, the regime that analytical model predicted. So for ionization, you have to be like this pressure, and this is collision ionization. So what we can see initially is that you know, from redshift one all the way to redshift zero, there is not much changing in the, in the, in the pressure profile. And this is interesting because this is also, you know, from redshift two to one, this is also the transition between the hot mode, the cold mode to the hot mode creation. So once the gas gets really virized to hot mode, the pressure profile seems to just become a constant sort of, well, it doesn't evolve that much. Uh, so what we can see in the shaded region is that collision ionization is important, maybe all the way up to 150 or so, you know, where the view radius of uh, around 0.5-ish, Okay, so at high redshift, most of the thing is actually collision ionized. And the photoionization is more important in the outskirts, if we believe what the analytical model predicts. And this is also seems to uh, be seen in the simulation. So I, well, I guess I've skipped this because I don't have much time. So the collision ionized gas, which is dominating the most of the oxygen-6 and the, within the video radius, where they come from. And I apologize very much. This is a very busy part. Uh, I want you to focus first is those, those particles. So this is a, you know, what we did is actually tracking uh, 25 particles, a bit more particles, with the largest oxygen-6 fraction back to redshift 3. And we see how the temperature and density and distance and also the fraction of oxygen-6 grow with time. So this is a very busy plot. Uh, want you to focus is. Firstly, you see those greenish and reddish lines. They jump up to the high temperature and high density, where they're very close to the disk. The distance is little. And then they kind of just cool down to the ambient, you know, five point, five point something. And this is producing quite a bit of oxygen, six here. Uh, I guess it's very hard to see, but they kind of stay in the highest fraction level all the way to the end of the simulation. Now, these are from the high redshift feedback because they are coming from the very center of the galaxy. Uh, do we see gas shock accretion? We do see those. You can look at the, this distance versus time, and you see there, there's a change here which corresponds to the gas being shocked. Now, there are shocked gas, but if you actually look at some of those curves, I, I, I apologize, it's still hard to see. Most of the curves are coming into an ISM sort of thing. So it shock heated, and then it creates into ISM. And the oxygen-6 fraction never stays very high. It just sort of fluctuates. So we conclude it's not very quantitative at this moment, is that the heating, at least the CGM oxygen-6, are mostly come from the feedback and the galactic wind. Uh, this is very preliminary results of, uh, 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 we actually look at the kinematics. So we, we have no, we did the, the spectra. And we don't know uh, whether this is actually, um, uh, the fitting is actually, there's any problem with the fitting. So we just did the artificial spectra, and then we fit with a program. And we look at the column density versus the broadening parameter. And we find that our line is actually quite broad. I still need lots of work to understand this. Uh, <clears throat> but let's move to the cooling, OK? If we increase the cooling, and we increase the feedback, and we get the same mass of stars, then what we have in, in, in this, in the halo? So remember, this is the movie snapshot of Aries at the redshift uh, 3 and redshift 0.3. And this is how it looks like. Right? When we increase the cooling, we increase the feedback. Even though the feedback is increased, there's generally much less warm hot gas. By warm hot, I mean 10 to 5 to 10 to 6 because of stronger cooling. So you have the oxygen 6 looks like that. And then at redshift 0, it looks like this. So total mass of oxygen 6 is a factor of 2 less. Okay. So <clears throat> not much oxygen-6 around outside the view radius anymore. So it changes. Uh -huh. So this is how the column density distribution changes. I mean, in fact, this is Eris, and this is Eris 2K. Well, you can see that the data, because the scatter, it's still OK. Maybe before, we were a little bit too high, and now we're kind of OK. But you know, it's, it's, it's already a lot less. It still could have quite similar picture of how it should evolve from high to low redshift, but uh, it, it decreased, certainly. 
So because the decrease, then if you look at the uh, photoionization, then you see majority of these center ones are collision ionized. And the photoionization component is much, much smaller. This is the same color bin here. Okay. okay. So last two slides. Um, I mean, one minute. Uh, well, no oxygen six. We say okay. No, both ways you can you can pr produce an early kind of okay oxygen six. And how about the low ions? It turns out that Aries doesn't have a good low ion column density at all. This is the data, and this is a simulation. Okay, this is two orders of magnitude less. Okay, this is the uh, uh, carbon two as an example, but it's, everything is the same. Uh, carbon three and magnesium two is the same. And this is Aries 2K, and we can get OK results for the low ions, which is quite uh, interesting. So maybe it means that you know, some of the low ion gas is actually cooling out of the hot halo. And this is quite a promising picture of getting low ions in the CGM. So at last, I want to just flash through. You know, We have the CGMs. That is, you know, should we believe Aries 2K more, or should we believe Aries more? And the CGM is not the whole picture. right? We also have the galaxy disk. So if you look at the, the stellar disk, and I know this is a very bad image, but you, you can see some sort of trend here. This is Aries. You have a thin disk. You have a central bulge. And this is how stellar looks like. When you have Aries 2K, the disk is much thicker. It actually doesn't have a bulge, but a very boxy, thick disk. So the disk structure of these two, and I, I think the kinematic structure of these two, it's going to be very different. Okay? And this is related to the star formation history. So what do we do? Maybe we need to we'll put too much of feedback there, right? They puff up the disk, or maybe we need a different feedback mechanism, which doesn't disturb the disk that much, or more accurate model of cooling plus heating, which Holly was talking about yesterday. So I don't have time anymore. I just leave my conclusion here. Take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sujin. We do have a minute and a half for uh, questions, so probably shout from the back. That's very interesting because, yeah, because the outskirts, I think it would be the, the region that uh, more observation data is needed. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe the, the results actually between the two, right? The Aries is not cooling enough, but Aries 2K is cooling too much. Other questions? No? Nope. Well, then, oh, okay. Is there any evidence for the need of shocks at all in the models, or you can do everything without, without the shocking behavior? You mean the shock from the creation gas? Yeah. Well, it seems, well, it's not quantitative at the moment. It seems majority of O6, at least from O6, is from the feedback. There it is, this gas shock definitely shock heated to 10 to the 6, 10 to the 5.5. It's the real temperature. But that, that, those gas doesn't really have much of the metal there, it seems like. Let's, let's thank Shijing once more. <laughs>